I'm Bill Cunningham. It's a common prejudice of those who live in big cities to believe that small towns offer little to do and even less to talk about, and that when something unusual does happen in a small town, it gets talked about for a long, long time. Take the case of the Kenora bank robber who blew himself up. It occurred more than a decade ago, yet there's hardly a person in Kenora, Ontario, who can't remember exactly what they were doing when it happened. It's an odd setting for one of Canada's most bizarre mysteries. Kenora is an Evinrude country, a mill town nestled amid the lakes and forests of northern Ontario. It's a town of pickup trucks which work, and mufflers which don't, and where caps are always in fashion. It's a town of good old boys, and cowboys, and Indians. It's Willie Nelson Country North, and on Saturday night you can buy excitement by the pint, and where even today, an entire evening's conversation can center on the strange occurrence that happened years ago, but which no one has forgotten. I couldn't believe there was a robbery going on in Kenora. A piece of flesh fell right in my, my car, blood all over the street. We looked up and there was money just all the way to the ground. It happened just before 3 o'clock on the afternoon of May the 10th, 1973. A stranger walked into the Main Street branch of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. He carried a couple of duffel bags in his hands and a desperate plan in his head. And so began a bizarre drama that ended in a thunderous explosion, the faint echoes of which continue to reverberate even to this day. I can still see him stocky. A chap with a plaid jacket on, a beard, as I turned to give him my attention. He said that this is a, a holdup. When he pulled the pistol out of his pocket, at that time he uh, pulled this, uh, what he called a dead stick, like a, a large uh, clothespin, uh, out of the pack in front of him. Bank manager Al Reed was on the phone, and he was only two days from a transfer to Winnipeg when a stranger walked unannounced into his office. I could see two wires from one end from each of the two ends uh, uh, that went led down into this pack and that he had strapped to his uh, waist. And he said, well, uh, if these two contacts come together, then the uh, dynamite I have in this pack will explode. In minutes, the bank was ringed by Kenora's finest, alerted by phone on the gunman's order. Practically everyone in town rushed to the main street to watch the goings on. The local radio station right across the street from the bank carried the whole thing live. For heaven's sakes, people, do stay away. Let's not hamper the police department's operation. Things seem to be well under control. I guess it's just a matter now for negotiations to take place. We didn't know anything about this man being wired for, uh, with a dead man's fuse in his mouth or anything like that. We didn't know anything about that. Reporter Clarence Dusang covered the story for the Kenora paper. Well, there was, well, the rumors were flying back and forth up and down the street, dynamite, and he has a bomb, there was another thing went out, but nobody was sure. The tension mounted, but the drama wasn't without its comic moments, especially when a local lad full of good spirits wandered into the bank off the street. My uncle, he was uh, drinking at the time, and I don't know how he got in there, because the police and that were all at the doors. And I guess that's when uh, bank robber fired two warning shots at him. One, I think, went in between his legs and one on the other side. And what did your uncle think of that? <laughs> he was gone. We haven't, we never seen him for about a week later. I don't know where he went, but he was gone, scaredless. Were you frightened? Uh, not really. I, uh, he, he didn't have a threatening uh, manner about him. This is, you know, thinking back, this is what rather surprised me. He didn't brandish the gun. Uh, or threatened, he just uh, wanted to show me that he had the gun, he had the upper hand, and he wanted to, me to do what, uh, what he told me. The dynamite-laden desperado stuffed more than a hundred grand into his tote bags and demanded a pickup truck with a police driver for his getaway. The job went to Constable Don Millier. So that's when Constable Millier came in, and of course he was in plain clothes, the hold-up man. He said, I wanted a... Uh, a police driver, and I said, well, he is a policeman. So uh, that seemed to satisfy him. 
The police driver led the way out of the bank, followed by the robber and the homemade bomb. The dead man's detonator was a crude device, but it was efficient. It kept the police at bay for more than an hour, and it worked the first time out. They came out of the bank, but stopped suddenly. The robber had forgotten his rifle. He ducked back in, retrieved it, and came out again. They both made a motion towards the truck. Well, the robber actually didn't make a motion. He was standing. And uh, Milliard sort of made a dive towards the ground. A shot rang out, and the explosion went off. Well, after the explosion, it was just like a war scene. The robber disappeared. People screamed. People run. And there was money showering all over the place. People were feverishly picking it up. There was pieces of this man lying about. Milliard was lying in, on the ground. He was badly hurt. The noise of the blast had barely died away when controversy exploded here at police headquarters. It centered on their handling of the case, especially in the last few dramatic minutes. Within a month, the hero of the piece, policeman Don Milliard, resigned. He charged that there had been no coordinated plan to deal with the emergency, that the officers were left to act on their own. At the time, police chief Webb Engstrom denied this and said they were trying to get the robber out of town where no civilians could get hurt. Inspector Walter Michalishan said that his men were not ordered to shoot. The sensitivity on the matter lives to this day, as we found out when the Kenora Police Commission forbade the police to even discuss the case with W-5. There's a public right to know about these Fine, things. Fine, you do your story. But, uh, does that Mayor Ken Winkler is a member of the Police Commission, which ordered the force not to talk to us, and he wouldn't talk on the record either. And the police chief changed his phone to an unlisted number when we pursued our inquiries. Townspeople speculate the official concern is protecting the town's image and that it overrides the necessity to widen the search for the gunman's identity. Well, how could a man come from out of nowhere? Nobody that I ever ran across uh, had any inclination of who he was. And, and then the surprising part was that nobody owned up to knowing him after. Whoever he was, he arrived on the early morning train from Winnipeg four days before the robbery. Police traced his half-mile ride from the railway station to the Kenrisha Hotel, which is just half a block from the bank where he met his ghastly end. He was carrying a survival kit, presumably planning an escape through the northern Ontario bush. He checked in under a false name and used a fictitious Toronto address. He left behind a trunk in room 407, Police thought it might be rigged as a bomb, so a bomb disposal squad blew it up, and with it, any clues it might have contained as to who he was. A picture of the gunman was compiled with the aid of bank manager Reed and other witnesses. After that, the trail went cold. But then, 10 years later, almost to the day, this torn and twisted piece of metal was found by workmen as they demolished a building. It was immediately identified as the gun which the robber had taken from bank manager Reed. The robber had then stuffed it into his belt next to the dynamite, and the blast had thrown it a couple of blocks down the town's main street. When it was found, it still had a round in the chamber, and it triggered the memory of Kenora's own dog day afternoon. The man is coming out. He's got a black stocking on his head. He's got three duffel bags, apparently full with money, it's the clothes peg in his mouth. He is carrying a flight bag. Uh, with what? Bloody hell, the bomb's The bomb off. has gone off. The bomb's a bomb has off. gone off. He's been shot. He's been... Stay back. Stay Windows have been blown out. There's debris. There are pieces of clothing and blood. The policeman who is with the, uh, the man appears to be not too badly injured. At least he's, he's able to stand up. The bank robber, one could only assume that Whoever he is, is no more. The money is all over the place. The police are, are keeping well control of it, keeping the people back. Obviously, this money has to be scooped up and accounted for. The Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce is, uh, the front of it is, uh, all the windows are blown out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's an experience which not many people have wished to go through again. This indeed will be a Thursday that the town of Kenora will not forget in a hurry. The unknown gunman is buried here, unmourned in an unmarked grave. The crime was solved by his own death, 
But the mystery endures. Who was he? Where did he come from? Does anyone miss him or grieve his loss? And what drove him to such a desperate gamble and such a sorry end? To this day, his grave's a quiet but insistent reminder that until these questions are answered, the case of the Kenora bank bandit who blew himself up cannot be closed. Sometimes when I come out of the pool or gym class, my skin begins to feel tight and dry, and even sometimes stings. Well, then, what do you do for your skin? I use Noxzema. I put it on every night, and I put it here and here and there, and I rub it all around, and then I wash it off, and it feels great. Mom told me to use Noxzema. I've used Noxzema for so many years, and I told my daughter about it. And I was right, wasn't I? But I was right, too, wasn't I, Mom? Well, it sounds like Noxzema is the right thing to use. Sure, if you want your skin to look as good as mine. <laughs> Fletcher, I don't need that report tomorrow. Great, JT. I need it tonight. But JT... When Fletcher can't leave the office behind, she appreciates her Model 100 computer from Radio Shack. It's a word processor, phone directory, automatic dialer. It even communicates with the office computer. Fletcher, how's that report? Fletcher. Radio Shack's Model 100, your office away from the office. You'll go far, Fletcher. Oh, <laughs> you'll go far. I have something that's so soft. And this something is so luxuriously thick, it's almost sinful. I use it every day and then just throw it away. New Kleenex Classique Tissue. Softer and thicker. Pure luxury. I can just throw away. <laughs> The move is on. All across Canada, over 50,000 people a month are leaving their old bank accounts and switching to daily interest savings at Bank of Montreal. I switch to earn daily interest the day I make a deposit. Interest paid monthly. That's 12 times a year. My old bank's regular savings account only paid up twice a year. That's why over 50000 a month are switching to daily interest savings. Enter the super-saving sweepstakes at the Bank of Montreal today. 